Awesome, thank you. So hi everyone and welcome to our online studio visit with Wilfredo. Uh, my name is Candice Nambard. I'm an artist curator trainee at Eastside Projects. Um, I'm also joined by Yaz, who is also an artist curator trainee at Eastside Projects. Yaz will be handling anything tech related and, and any questions or issues that you have. So if something crops up, crops up during today's talk, feel free to send them a private message and I'm sure they'll do their best to help you with that. So just for a visual description, I'm actually at home, not in the gallery space, unfortunately, but I am a black person with a shaved head, I'm currently wearing a black hoodie and my background, you can see my wardrobe, a box from some stuff I had to unpack <laughs> um, and a, a cream wall. And uh, yeah, I am very, very excited to have a conversation today with Will, somebody I, for, for, for full reference, somebody that I know. Uh, personally and have, have had the pleasure and privilege of working with in the past um, and yeah I'm very looking I'm very much looking forward to today's talk about Will and Will's work and some upcoming work that's going to be presented and shown in Eastside Projects. So for those of you that might not know myself or Eastside Projects this is just a quick introduction. Um, Eastside Projects is an artist run multiverse commissioning producing and presenting experimental art practices and demonstrating ways in which art may be useful um, as part of society. Eastside Projects provides vital infrastructure, supports best practices and work to expand that role of the artist run space. Um, I am very, very privileged and very, very blessed to be working as part of such a wonderful team, wonderful organization, and to be able to facilitate some really great conversations such as these. Um, so, to kind of jump into it straight away, really, um, Will, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and then we can start talking about a little bit of your writing and, and, and editing work? Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Wilfredo Furtado. Uh, I'm an artist, writer and uh, editor, uh, also currently the deputy editor of the art platform uh, Contemporary Ants. And I will be, first I work with images, text, uh, and body um, to explore the intersection of pop culture, decolonial thought, queerness, blackness, technology, um, and other things. Um, and uh, yeah, I will be doing uh, a new commission for Eastside Projects uh, very soon. Uh, Yaz, do you mind just getting up the slide presentation, please, and putting it on the contemporary end side? So, the way I came to know Will is actually through writing. Um, I was living in Berlin at the time. And uh, for, as many young people do, trying to figure out what my role in Berlin was. <laughs> and I think Will actually found me through a blog post that I'd written and then reached out to me to write for a magazine that you were an editor of at the time. Um, and, you know, Will's kind of was one of my first introductions really into writing about art criticism, um, and ways of thinking around how we discuss, demonstrate, and represent art spaces, particularly as it pertains to artists of color, but not necessarily, um, not necessarily that on, on its own. But um, I was really, really, what I found really quite compelling about Will's writing was just how simple and accessible it was, insofar as it doesn't necessarily, in my in my understanding and reading of your writing. Um, the way you describe and talk about art is not necessarily with the jargon of, of art school, um, of art language, and, and actually brings together like some what was seemingly complex ideas around art making and art practice into layman's terms. Um, and that's what I think really kind of shaped my understanding of how to write, um, write about art and engage with art in a criti critical level. Um, so can you just talk about, you know, you know, writing your use of language, writing about art um, and working within contemporary and uh, sure. Um, and, and yeah, first of all, yeah, I, I still do remember <laughs> reaching out to you because uh, you had this great blog uh, and you're really prolific and you kind of wrote about everything, you know, like culture, fashion, arts, race, society. And uh, I just thought you had a very honest way of, 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 of writing and, um, and I just wanted to tap into that. So I just, uh, just emailed you and I think 
possibly commission you to to write something or, or just ask if you were interested at the time i was i was working i was the uh, arts and digital editor for a fashion art magazine uh, based in berlin called sleek magazine and um and four years ago i started working at contemporary and and so it was really at sleek when i started like playing with you know with words um in, in on a more critical level um about fashion but mostly about art um and so which led me to the job at contemporary and because contemporary and uh, for contemporary it's very important to have accessible language because we are an international uh, platform um and we want to be read by um, I mean, anyone has an internet connection, and, and we understand that it's uh, important to have accessible language uh, when talking about art, because very often <clears throat> art engages with, um, you know, topics like across the spectrum. So it's kind of like unfair that, you know, like an artist might work with, say, like a marginalized topic uh, or about marginalized people, but then does not have the language that the marginalized person would be able to understand and engage with. And so for us, and for me personally, um, yeah, it's very important for your language to be clear, accessible, um, and, and sort of like understandable, um, which is actually uh, a tactic that, um, you know, media like you know the sun uses because they have a re like a reading difficulty of for like i think a seven-year-old i think that's uh that's how they work um which makes perfect sense you know if you want to reach the masses then like you have to do this um it's just also important that it's not just sort of like people on the right that are trying to be accessible uh, and you know also everyone else um yeah, what else can I say? <laughs> I think what's I think what one of the, the sort of one of the things that I found really great about contemporary and as well is that it, it's its commitment to documenting art from from the African diaspora in, it, in its entirety and and African folks that live within the African continent, but African or people of African descent that are elsewhere in the world. Um, and that it's also available in Spanish, is it not? You you have like the, the Latin version of contemporary and um, so I'm interested in, in like how your thoughts on how this sort of approach to um, a global art critique or practice like intersects with your own creative practice and, and how, you know, are there spaces within your role as an editor that sort of overlap with your role as, a, as an artist? Mm. Um, yeah, just to add to what I said earlier, yeah, so contemporary and it's a, an art platform uh, and not we don't do just editorial, we also do uh, workshops. Uh, insight um, and traveling exhibitions um, and um, and the aim is to well connect the whole African diaspora so we we are pan-African uh, including diaspora and we have two editions um, we are online and in print and we have two editions the international one which is in English and French uh, and we have the Latin American one uh, which is in English Spanish and, and Portuguese um, and what we're trying to do really is to, um, you know, raise the level of, of cognizance, of, of awareness um, and, um, and platform and, and highlight and spotlight um, voices or perspectives that have been previously overlooked. And so that's why you will not uh, find, say, like an art star on contemporary art because like, we're not about that. Um, how that intersects with my personal practice um, intersects in, 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 in many ways. Um, I kind of feel that um, I started working with, with them because of already how I wrote and thought and worked, um, but also the way that Contemporary And was formed um, was also already in conversation with, with how I do, with how I work. And, um, and for those who may follow my Instagram, you can probably see that there's there's a lot of uh, there's not so many um, borders in between various elements of my private and professional life. Like everything comes together, um, and so I influence um, you know the editorial of contemporary and as much as the editorial of contemporary influence my practice. 
Um, and, and, it's, and so it's, it's very much about bringing different ideas, different aesthetics together um, and working within a specific, <clears throat> within a specific framework. And so like, we don't have a manifesto, we don't have like a do's and don'ts kind of list. <clears throat> we don't have a rule book, but we work within a specific uh, framework. Uh, which is, you know, a decolonial one, uh, one that's against white supremacy um, uh, and against discrimination and oppression and imperialism. Um, and so it's more about working within this way of thinking rather than having a specific, like, uh, rule book. Um, and there's just so much that um, has influenced my practice from uh, from contemporary, but also um, from the work that I did at Asli previously, um, because it was very much focused on pop, pop culture, fashion, um, and cont contemporary visual culture. And you see, you find that in my work too. How I work with, like, say, internet aesthetics, uh, for instance. Um, and um, first, there's a there's a very specific case from uh, from a story at uh, in contemporary art. That's an interview with uh, Arjuna Padra, in which he explains that uh, in every north there is a south, and in every south there is a north. Um, you know, using the example of that someone in a in a ghetto that's outside Chicago might have actually more to do uh, or more in common with someone from the global south in general terms than say someone from Manhattan and so that sort of like really made me kind of like place myself within within our world and so and so and to recognize that um, you know even like within me there can be elements of a global north and a global south and also in the in the same way that that can make me at the same time an oppressor and be oppressed at the same time and sort of like thinking in this way has been really helpful especially because i work with um with uh, with a lot of people i i tend to work like collaboratively and that's a really important framework to work within uh when you do this um yeah because you are you have to be responsible for what you do um and so yeah so it's about responsibility and accountability um yeah yeah, I, I think that comes across very, very strong. We've just got one of your works up here on, on the screen as well. I think that responsibility of work, working within a particular framework, but not necessarily um, being so staunch with the parameters of that framework. Um, it comes across in, you know, in the language that you use, the collaborators that you have, and especially within contemporary and the, the kind of people that are writing for you. It's almost like a... Um, undisclosed but shared knowledge of you know working within an anti-racist um, and working within a global practice that is fair and respectful of the many experiences and cultures that the work and the writing taps into. Um, I'm wondering if you could get, explore about a, a little bit of that in relation to your like ring the neck language series. So we've got one of the images on the screen here. Um, this sort of um, melding of the writer, the artist, the performer, the observer kind of exists within this sort of mixed media work. Can you talk a little bit about like the origins of this series and, and what kind of things that you're trying to embody and express within the production of it? Yeah, I'm not sure at which, at which point uh, was, what was the specific <clears throat> origin uh, of the series, but there is something that um, Fabian uh, Villegas from Contra Narrativas uh, one said um, about, uh, specifically about language in Latin America, that language often in Latin America is used not so much to, to say, to reveal, but to hide. Mm. And that really like really spoke to me. And, uh, and, and, and that is really related to this image with, with, that we're looking at, um, this uh, mixed media collage, because uh, I'm, I'm using the word mestizos, which, uh, um, which in Spanish means basically uh, mixed, uh, and mixed specifically like white European and, and, and indigenous. Um, and so what does this word say? I mean, the word says that, yeah, you white mixed. Um, and people use this term to, you know, to claim ownership of the land, you know, so like I'm, I'm not fully white, so I can, I can own this land too. Um, but at the same time, they completely um, ignore everything that has to do with indigeneity, um, you know, and so, so it kind of like, 
reveals what this word is for, you know? So it's to, and you can see in the image of like indigenous uh, Guatemalans uh, in color, and then in black and white, you can see uh, a, a, um, basically like colonists of the 18th century uh, in Guatemala. These are sort of like found images, but sort of like real images of families who live uh, in, in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, the series is very much, very much about what words um, hide, yeah, mm. what words hide. I mean, what does it mean for you to, like, use, like, a non -anglo like, non-anglophone spaces or uh, European languages, I guess, um, as a site of play? Because I, I, I'm quite, in, you know, there was a talk yesterday uh, run by the RCA, um, I'm going to forget all the participants, but I think Lola Alafemi, Zarina from the White, uh, White Pube, uh, Russian, and, and somebody else who I've forgot, unfortunately. They were looking at play, play within art practice. And I think that's what I, I find quite compelling about your work as well, like, is that you often play with not just language, but aesthetics as well, which we'll, we'll talk about in just a moment. But, you know, what does it mean to you as, as somebody who does speak several languages um, to use that as a site of play within your practice and, and performance? It's uh, for me. It's about um, what can what can this play, this hide and seek kind of game, uh, reveal about yourself? How can you know more about yourself uh, through through languages that may or may not sort of uh, they may not have grown up with? Um, and so, for instance, you know, I don't speak French very well at all. Um, but for instance, there, there is this word uh, in French, which is, which is banlieue, mm -hmm. um, which does not exist, does not exist in Portuguese, because I, I spent my childhood in Portugal, and does not exist in English, what I moved to in my teens. But banlieue basically means like um, outskirts, but it's, it's very, um, it's in a way, so it's, it's an already like racialized and, and, um, and, and, and there's like a, a class aspect also attached to it. Um, which, which, which we don't have, say, in Portugal, although I was also, also grew up in the outskirts of, of Lisbon. Um, and we also don't have that in English. Perhaps in London you'd say, um, like, the estate, but you can have the estate in Islington as well, you know, whereas, whereas Banya means outside the city centre, mm -hmm. um, possibly um, poor, working class, um, immigrant, um, and then itself, it's, it's a whole culture in itself, like it's a thing, you know, and, um, and it's so important to, to have words that, that can describe experiences, because otherwise you are kind of, you're like a little bit lost and you don't have the language to sort of like explain who you are and what you want as well, because uh, desire is also very important, but you need a language to have that. Uh, and also like to have agency, you need a language. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and first like I was talking to, to a, a friend and artist, uh, Mahmoud Halid, and he was saying that we are kind of so lucky now to, to have so many terms um, through the, you know, through the internet that we didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. that are so helpful, you know, to have specific words and terms. Uh, and he, like, he gave the example of, uh, you know, of gaslighting, that just by knowing what it means, you can place yourself in the world and it gives you agency. And, and, and that's why sort of like the written word is still so massively important in the age of images, when mm -hmm. images are actually more valuable than words. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we can see it here also, we're going to, do a quick introduction to um, a series of work that you're currently working on actually called Sexual Healers TV and, and that taps more into like something you like queer epistemologies I guess um, but it also ex examines and, and re relates to this idea of like the the hidden and the revealed in using language but also in incorporating this um, this idea of performance. Um, I think Yaz if you can go on to the next slide we have a short trailer that sort of introduces Sexual Healers TV We'll give that a watch and then we'll have a little talk about, about this work because I, I love this work. I think it's great. Thank you. Hopefully this sound too. So 
So, Ren, do we have any? Are we able to make the sound available? Or yeah, no? I will just have to stop share and then reshare. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. But um, yeah, so I think what I, I find quite fascinating about Sexual Healer's CV is this idea, for me as well, as somebody who works with words and performance, um, is how we find the balance and the blend between the two um, and, what, and what that reveals about the work. I'm going to stop talking because it's going to start to play in a minute, but we'll talk about my fascination with Sexual Healer's in just a minute. Sorry, yes, you can carry on. Thank you. Sexual TV. Welcome to Sexual Healers TV, your pro home womanist web channel dedicated to sex work. Um, Versace. Necesito de ti una fotografía que la hago yo aquí mismo en la cocina, acá. Hola Eric, para mí es muy importante que estés aquí porque es mi primera vez que voy a hacer un, un porno entonces me gustaría mucho bueno, conocer la persona, con quien uh, lo voy a hacer Hola Leo ¿Cómo estás Willy? Bien, gracias uh, Estoy muy contento por hablar contigo porque estás haciendo algo muy genial que es un abogado Uh, pero igual estás, es también un actor porno y vives los, los videos con muy abiertamente. Y bueno, he decidido que no, no lo voy a hacer, no lo quiero hacer porque no me gustan las condiciones um, y no quiero como ser, que me exploiten así. Pero igual tampoco creo que, que lo deberías hacer. A ver. Bueno. Bueno, como sabes, estoy también haciendo como un proyecto de arte y, y bueno, la idea es que, bueno, te voy a proponer que sí que lo hagas, pero que lo hagas conmigo. As soon as the recording devices or technologies are in operation. Bueno, puedes pensar, pero te podría pagar lo mismo, o sea, sí, te pago el mismo. Y más allá, te voy a dar regalías también. Te voy a dar como 30% del de dinero que haga con el video. Technological advancement puts to shame societal advancement. Between technological innovation and social change stands the body politic. And the black trans body politic is the connecting cable. Okay, thank you, Yaz, uh, for sharing that. Um, you. Can you talk a little bit about the the ending, the like about black trans body politics and it being the connecting cable? Um, yeah. So one of the premises of Sexual Healers TV is um, that this connection, or we are trying to connect society, um, technological uh, innovation and advancement with social change or social advancement, because there, there is a, a huge gap. And uh, it's so important with social, Sexual Healers TV, which is a platform for biopolitics and sex work, because sex and sex work are some, some of the main drivers of technological advancement, you know, like look at Facebook, look at the rewind button, there's so many things. Uh, and actually, if you look at the sex industry and porn industry, you are looking at the future of, uh, of technology uh, in, in many ways. Um, and so that's why to me with this project is really important to bridge this gap. And to me personally, I think that black Black trans body politics is one of the is is one of the epistemologies that can make that connection because it, it was through it was through uh, black trans women uh, whom uh, through whom I learned um, that um, when working with marginalized people, especially like in the arts, it's very important to 
to place the marginalized person at the center of the conversation as well. Um, and this is something that I've only ever heard from a black trans woman. And so to me, it's not about the trans black body in of itself, but about the, uh, the knowledge behind that and the epistemologies that black trans women create. And so, and so this is again, like the framework within which I work uh, with uh, specifically specifically uh, sexual healers TV. Mm. Um, yeah, and so it's about the knowledge and the epistemologies created by these same people rather than necessarily having a black trans woman in as, as the image, as the poster uh, girl of, of the project, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I definitely agree. Oftentimes I was watching something, I can't remember where, not too long ago, where they were saying that often new advancements in, in technology that is later rolled out to be of public use, like things like unlocking your um, your phone with your, with your thumbprint or using facial ID or VR and AR is actually tested in pornography first. So oftentimes you'll find technological advancements where having like AR, um, I guess, sexual rooms or spaces, it's tested in, in pornographic spaces first before it's then brought out to public, to public view and public knowledge. Um, but oftentimes we, we don't necessarily talk about who, at the expense of whom do these technological technological advancements come and oftentimes yeah I, I would be inclined to agree that it is at the expense of, of exploring if not exploiting um trans folks and in particular black trans folks um can you talk about a little bit why you went to Colombia and are working within a, a south american context for, for was, sexual healers tv yeah i was in Colombia to for um for a, a residency uh exchange and a university exchange and um, and so I was like taking classes at, uni at the university and sort of just getting to know the country. Uh, and, and through, and there was things that I, I specifically wanted to do there and we, we're gonna talk about that later. Um, but then this specific project um, happened because I was invited to do for a porn audition um, and I mean, I don't know, I was always very curious and, um, and, and so I just went for it because I was just curious and I, I, I and also considered doing it, but then I, I just, the conditions were not for me. Mm. Um, and so, and that just, um, yeah, just, uh, just became Sexual Healers TV because mm. I really wanted to, uh, to dig deeper. Um, but also because the thing that struck me the most was that I, I could identify so many parallels with how people are treated in the creative industry, in the arts, in, in the fashion. Um, and, and to me, it was just like, just striking. And I had to do something about it because to me, it was interesting to find out perhaps uh, how could we learn from each other? How could, how could one industry learn from the other and, and, and so on and vice versa. Mm. Uh, and that's something that like, I'm still trialing, so to speak, with Central Wheelers TV. And that's something I really have to push for because not most, but many people that sort of like experience the work, like have a very um, a reductive view of it and cannot see past, you know, the, oh my God, it's sex. You're talking about sex and cannot see, cannot look at the structures, you know, mm. because it's it's all about the structures in the end. Mm, I think that we're going to, I'm just going to slightly move you forward if that's all right, um, in relation to your project Skip and in particular, like looking at the body as an object, but also looking at the body as a site of, of performance in many ways as it relates to, to sex work, but also the body as a site of experience. I think so often in an art context where we're used to viewing it as it is and not understanding there's a process that comes between, that comes before the body is revealed in it as a site of, of objectivity. Um, and I think you kind of explore that within in Skip in what you described as a lecture dance performance, which for me just, rings a lot of bells in a, in a very positive way. Um, we also have, I don't know how much time we have, but maybe we can show a small clip of Skip and explore further this idea about like how we how we view the body and especially, I'm quite apprehensive about using the phrase black bodies just because I, I feel it's been, it's kind of been twisted and, and used in, in a particular context that I don't think actually relates to the personhood of people that they're talking about. But I think Skip does a really, really great example of, of looking at 
traditions within um, African practices and how that's translated or, or represented in a global context um, and looking at the body as a site of play performance um, and of interest as well. So hopefully we can get a little video of that coming up. Just a silent round of applause for Yaz that's doing all the tech for us today. I'm very, very grateful Thank for them. Yes. Thank you, much appreciated. So Queer black bitch killer. Sorry, great... my, my mouse is being very <laughs> not, it's not letting me click certain things. <laughs> Let me just, I'm just gonna try a different mouse quickly. All right, thank you. Well, can you, well, well, while Yaz is sorting that out, Will, do you mind just having a quick introduction about what Skip is before people watch it no, or watch no, a short clip? We just played the first like minute. Uh, it's also mm. good. Uh, Yaz, I don't, I don't really mind. Yeah, is that okay? Queer yeah. black bitch killer. Me la nina que mata más que la guerrilla. Esta bala no esquivas. Maniquí se vitrina. El estilo que siempre aniquila. Viva negra marica. A los machos conmigo en la fila. Queer black bitch killer, queer black bitch killer. Melanina que mata más que la guerrilla, esta bala no esquiva. Queer black bitch killer, queer black bitch killer. Maniquí sin vitrina, el estilo que siempre aniquila. Queer black bitch killer, queer black bitch killer. Viva negra marica, a los machos ponemos en la fila. Queer black bitch killer, queer black bitch killer, queer black bitch killer. Estas letras en mi cuerpo, Wakanda bitch pantera. Estampados. Awesome. Thank you, Yaz, for sharing that. Um, there's so much that I want to attack, but we have we don't have a exorbitant amount of time. But I guess the main things that I want to talk about as it relates to Skip is perhaps the your understanding and representation of the lecture dance performance and also the aesthetic of of this work as well and your your kind of reasons for that um and a little bit about how you're linking like diaspora culture within the use of this aesthetic as well so you can tap into any of that as as you wish yeah so i decided well i i knew i wanted to do like a performance uh exactly about these like topics about the influence of african cultures in 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 Latin America, like as a whole, um, or how um, a lot of Latin American culture is rooted in, um, in, in African cultures and was made by Afro Latinos. Um, and I knew you wanted to, I knew, I knew you had to be performance, but at the same time, I have this background as a writer. And so for me, it's very important to also say things. Uh, and be kind of kind of clear about them as well. This is where again where the clarity comes 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 through. Um, at the same time, I still think that I leave a, a lot of room for ambivalence. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would like to stress that again because it's still you know still art, and uh, I'm, I'm not here to create dogmas or to replace one dogma with another. I'm here to open the field for even more subjectivities. Um, but I still want to say things clearly, you know, and pass on specific messages, perhaps not the clearest message, but specific messages. And so I also wanted it to be then a lecture performance where we actually talk and say things. And um, we just watched the first, uh, the first minute, uh, which is a song by Lomas Bayou, who I collaborated with. 
and she's uh, she's a performance artist and rapper and so we sang her songs uh, and her songs kind of frame the lecture dance performance uh, and so in between the songs we would uh, also do like a lecture and to me it was very important to to be a dance performance of some sort because we were talking about we were, we were talking about like dance and body movement and the body it's, it's itself as well um and so to me it was very important to sort of like you know link content and form and do something about that i did not want to make a performance about dance and sort of like be sat with my arms crossed that just that, that does not make sense to me maybe for the people does and that's great too but to me that just wouldn't make sense um and so yeah so i just developed this kind of like sort of lecture dance performance mm. which is which mixes the the three mm. um and yeah and so in the lecture we engage with all of the the, the topics related to um, Afro-Latinidad and music and, and culture. Uh, and we also like threw in a lot of a lot of theory as well. Not very extensively, we, we threw in like the main ideas um, that um, in themselves kind of like open the room, open the field for people to, you know, pose more questions uh, to the work, but hopefully also to themselves and uh, and also like their position or in relation to what they experiencing and hopefully also further research the names that we um, talk about and so on. Mm, yeah, I think it's a great, a uh, great springboard, great platform and a great entryway into looking. I feel like oftentimes when we're talking about body politics, especially queer body politics, as it as it relates to black folk um, in, in various forms and capacities, um, it's this. It's a very detached way of viewing the body, um, and oftentimes you don't actually get to see it in its in its physical form, and in its capacities to move, to explain, to to perform, to share, to invigorate, to anger, um, to arouse even. Um, and I, and I think that's that's kind of the beauty of using a, 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 the the aesthetic of performance because you are able to kind of invite different sites of, of practice and theory into into that. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's quite genius. And um, if you, I'm sure that it will be available on the internet at some point for folks to kind of tap into a little bit further. But in terms of like your kind of exploring of the body, queer epistemologies uh, and performance, you were also doing a project for Eastside Project, which will be happening very, very soon. Yeah. Um, and this project is uh, co curated by Harold Offey, who I believe is in the chat, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, Gavin Wade at ESA Projects. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about this Loop project that will be taking place this year and some of the work that you're gonna be producing for Loop for those that might be interested in coming to view it in the gallery? Uh, yeah, do you think it makes sense that uh, we talk about the, well, the, the, well, the, the theme? Uh, first yeah totally like as just as you whatever you wish to kind of open up a, about it is that was totally fine um well so the theme is loop and um and i'm i'm personally engaging with it uh more in a sense of how uh history especially colonial history um you know repeats itself um but also how you know like everything is connected and so like goes round and round and round uh, and so my proposal uh, is also a lecture dance performance uh, that links different cosmologies um, that view the universe as an interconnected entity. And these cosmologies don't necessarily have, uh, at first sight, anything to do with each other. Um, but they are the Mayan cosmovision, uh, Sufism, um, and Leibniz's um, idea of the monad, Leibniz, the German philosopher. Um, the working title is We Are Everything and Everyone That Came Before Us. And it's going to, I don't reveal too much, but it's going to have um, like a religious feel. <laughs> and it's gonna be like a mix between like a TED talk and a dance choreography. <laughs> 
<laughs> sounds like a great combination uh yeah for those that, that are interested in loop um will is just one of a few artists that will be participating in this loop project that will be appearing at ESO projects on, in june that will the first iteration of it um and looking at it as a work in progress will appear in june the 11th of june specifically so if you check on the ESO projects website we have a little page that kind of describes the project of loop and um, the artists that are participating in it and you'll be able to see sort of some of the works that will participate in the later project in progress so a lot of these works aren't completed yet but you'll get an insight into what loop will be and this is in partnership with dance exchange which is a dance site and a festival in birmingham so i'm very much looking forward to this this is actually the first time i've really had to got to dig deep into into your contribution to loop so that's great to hear that from you um we have about 15 minutes left can I, just, and, can I just add the yeah of course the also very important aspect of the collaboration because i'm doing a collaboration for this yeah 100 go for it commission and uh, and so i'm collaborating with um with Bad Sister, who is a DJ and music producer based in Sao Paulo. Um, she mixes genres such as techno, Chicago house, Brazilian funk, um, as someone wants to describe it, like music of the global ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> and she's made mixtapes for BBC Radio 1, uh, Todd the T Show, and has worked with Linda Quebrada and Judo Bairro. Uh, and I'm also working with Trashy Clothing, who are, um, designing the costume sculpture and they are a satirical political and queer ready to wear policy in the fashion brand uh, founded in occupy this jerusalem in 2017 by shukri lawrence uh, and omar breiker um, who also started uh, the world's first cyber fashion week uh, last year Nice, that's great. Well, maybe we, we've got a couple of questions coming, but maybe just to kind of follow on from that, maybe can you talk a, bit, a little bit about um, the role that collaboration plays within the creating of your work? And, and is it central actually to the production of your work? Um, to me, it's, it's very important to work with other people and collaboratively. Uh, especially because I really like the idea of bringing different worlds together. And so often a lot of the people that I work with don't, don't, do not work uh, and are not also very familiar with, uh, with the arts, with the, you know, the industry of contemporary art, which is the industry I am most familiar with and uh, I, I'm, I'm very much uh, associated with. And so to me that's very important to, to yeah to bring these different worlds together to sort of like find out what 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 comes out of it you know it's, it's an experiment uh and it's a challenge as well of course not everything it's a challenge because we speak different languages you know um and we have different understandings of what we want from from the work that we do and what we do with it what is it for and so yeah it's an experiment and um and um, yeah, I'm just excited about what could potentially come out of it for, for the work itself, but also for us as people and, mm. and as professionals. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I have largely so far worked outside of a, um, a sort of institutional art space and often my contact with it as somebody who is interested in research in, in writing and, and does, is a writer and works in performance as well to a certain extent. Um, the, the 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 literal language of how my work is described is something that sometimes I feel quite resistant to, because it's it's being put in a particular context of 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 an art space and how you talk and represent work within an art space, and so I find that a lot of my collaborators that I work with personally who are not who wouldn't self describe as artists are coming with a very particular language and approach to the to the process of making, and I think that I find that quite rejuvenating uh, to work within those contexts and then see how that translate when you put it into say an installation or a gallery space or maybe even a civic space or part of the public, um, which is maybe what I find quite fascinating about Sexual Healers TV because you're working with folks that. Um, perhaps are considered an artist in, in, in one sense, um, but you're working with folks who, you know, are using their site of body as a, as a site of performance in, in many ways, but are not looking at it in an artistic practice. Or maybe they are, I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah. yeah. Like their body is their raw material, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, not just the body, but also, you know, their erotic uh, power, so to speak. It's the raw material that they use. And yeah, as you said, they may not see themselves uh, like us as artists or like contemporary artists, but there, there's something there, right? There's something mm -hmm. there. And, um, and it's, um, I think it's just about exploring that, uh, mm -hmm. also especially because like the body is so, uh, in many ways, kind of like undervalued uh, and just, um, it's still taboo, right? Like the body, especially like the neck, is still taboo in 2021. So there's a lot there to sort of like um, engage with. Mm, I agree. And especially it's also taboo in terms of how, uh, I guess, to be to be quite forward, how, how non-white or folks talk about and use and represent their own body um, within these art spaces. Uh, we're seeing a lot more, I think, artists more generally working within self-portraiture um, or using or representing black fingers quite openly um, within their work and having their own conversations and discussions about what it means to represent a black figure or a, a non-white figure should I to be more broad um, within an artistic space um, and not just looking at sort of the politics behind putting a black person or a non-white person into an art space but actually what it means is just to see this body as a site of performance that happens to be xyz descriptors um, but to call it out so specifically and so staunchly um, adds another I guess another dynamic to the work because it's not just about this is just a body this body has its own politicized history separate from what an art space wants to view and put on this body um, it, it comes with its own context and I think that's what I find so fascinating about working outside of a sort of anglophone space is that you're so connected to a very particular culture and place and particular praxis that comes with working in that, uh, that culture and space um, and then you'll bring it to an audience that perhaps has limited knowledge of what it means to work within those confines so yeah there's definitely a lot of bridging um, with use of language and performance um, and, and the aesthetics of the work you know very stylized bright bright and bold work um, that puts it in a very like you said you mentioned earlier particular pop culture uh, frame of reference but actually is using theory and praxis that extends quite far beyond um, the the technology that is using within within the work if that makes sense um, I think we have we've got about 10 minutes and I know that we had a question that popped up which I think actually related to some of costuming or design um, I can't find the question give me just a second um, I think this is a question from Madeline and they said, um, if you have time, could you talk about what you were wearing in Skip um, and the, what is the significance of wearing high vis within that, within that performance? Uh, yeah, so actually who, who we, des we designed those costumes. So I, I, had, I had the idea of using uh, that specific material. Uh, and then I just told Lomas Bello that, um, that, that, was, that was the idea. And Lomas Bello, like, he, he designed, like, they designed them. Hmm. Um, um, and it came from the fact that I, I I saw it a lot in Colombia while I lived in Colombia. Um, and it spoke a lot to me because it, it was something that a lot of, uh, you know, workers uh, used. Uh, but at the same time, whether you want it or not, it's like, it's, uh, it's also very uh, linked uh, to, you know, fetish wear. Not only because like it's a strap, but also because, you know, the, the, the worker is also, a fetish in themselves uh, within, uh, you know, like a, within like porn or, um, and so that was the idea behind it, but also because the, the high visibility is also, um, it's also telling you uh, to, be, to be careful, there is danger here. And so it was also like about that to, to, to warn people that, um, you know, these bodies uh, are aware. And so, you know, be careful also. But it's, you know, it's about mixing all these different elements, you know, like there's the element of sex, there's the element of danger, there's the element um, of the, the, the body that is fragile um, and that it needs to be, you know, looked after. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a hot color as well, so. <laughs> 
yeah the reveal and what's hidden and what, what is revealed when you hide certain things and what, what is revealed when you amplify certain things uh, mm -hmm. I think that's great we have a uh, another question here from Julie and uh, that says how do you keep motivated you know short and sweet um through through engaging with with the world and the people that are around, and, around me I, I know it's really like tough uh you know say you know watching the news for instance um but i don't know i like i still i still watch news and i still engage with the world around me um not so much in the sense of um that I could save the world or something, but it kind of really positions me, positions me in the world um, and sort of like makes me, um, it reminds me of my agency um, and also my position in this world as someone who is also very priv privileged um, and someone who is also um, an oppressor and an oppressed and just engaging with all these complexities, you know, just engaging what it means to be a human being today. Mm. And uh, and just all of this just, um, yeah, just really motivates me to keep doing work as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose in, in some respects as well, like the people that you work with or the people that you um, collaborate with and explore, they, they can also be a source of motivation, I imagine. Um, especially, you know, when they're living such active and, um, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and also just the fact that uh, you know you invited me to do this, and and I can, I can work with other people that otherwise I wouldn't work. I mean, that's like a dream come true, you know. Mm -hmm. Just uh, so, re yeah, it really is sort of like working with other people, meeting people, engaging with them and the world, and creating things together. Yeah, that really turns me on. <laughs> <laughs> happy to hear that um and yeah I, I think i think all that will come out definitely with 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 loop as well um you know the like you said you're working with i imagine artists that you haven't worked with you're working in a, a particular context with artists that maybe you haven't worked with before um and it feels all a bit touch and go because we're working within an online context or a digital space which you know the the use of tech also, also pertains to your work in, in in some regard as well but um yeah, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how these ideas about collaboration, visibility, language and sight of play um, come about in this loop project. So we're going to be like winding down very soon, unless anybody has any of the burning questions they want to put into the chat, I say ask now. Um, but if not, I will just say thank you so much Will for like joining us today and yeah. giving us a little insight into some of the what you've been doing and then what's going to be happening on in loop um yeah happening at loop at Eastside projects this year so for those of you that are interested in what we've got coming up we've got let me check my notes we've got an event on the 27th of may called what is the role of the studio in a pandemic so uh, i guess that, you know kind of tag tagging off will's work here as well like how are we working within particular context um given the restraints that we find ourselves in um we also have in relation to loop on the 11th of june we'll be doing a live stream of some of the works in process in progress sorry that will be taking part um that will be revealed later on in loop which will take place later on this year so keep your eyes peeled on isa project socials and we'll be highlighting that and then the next studio visit that we have is on the 24th of june and that's with adham framway so like if you are if you've liked what you've heard today and seen today and explored today, just keep your eyes peeled with what we've got going on. So I don't think we have any of the questions. Um, I just want to say thank you again, Will, for joining us from Berlin. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. For those of you that are, that are with us, stay tuned for the next studio visits and the next events that we're having. And also maybe a bigger announcement is that Eastside Projects will be reopening um, on the 19th of May. So uh, if yes, if you could be great, if you could just drop the booking link into the chat, that'd be awesome. So we are making the gallery available via booking slot. So if you pick a time and place to come in, we'll be here <laughs> just so around the world. And we have two shows on in the gallery. We have work by Harren Morrison. Um, and we also have a group project called, it might be nothing, but it could be something. And that's a group of artists that are working in the context of the insecurity project in collaboration with Birmingham University. So 
yes I think that's all my final line of notes <laughs> for everybody uh, but all information will be available on our website as well so yeah thank you everyone for joining us today um and this will be available in the interwebs somewhere at some point uh, so stay tuned for that okay awesome choose a uh, choose brenda <laughs> choose bye everyone thank you thank you <laughs>